somehow intuited this very uh, early on, but you know, we're living in a moment of rather obvious ecosystemic crisis. Uh, I remember reading when I was about 12 years old that if present trend is continued by the year 2000, there'd be no plants in Japan, which, uh, you know, alarmed me at the time, but of course turned out to be greatly exaggerated to right. paraphrase, uh, right. Mark Twain, right. which doesn't mean of course that we don't take these things seriously, but it does mean that <clears throat> we might move beyond our initial panic and wonder at what the best approach is to something like sustainability. And I went through a long period where, I was looking for solutions to the problem of sustainability in the external world by governing our consumer behavior, by finding it in technology, looking at systemic levels. <clears throat> and all those things have merit. Um, but a little bit, you know, further on, it seems to me that the way forward in sustainability is really this inward revolution where we have to paradoxically not concern ourselves immediately with sort of egoic success about how sustainable we are or aren't, and instead solve our inner issues, which then will manifest their way out through the system. I don't think there's a lot of ears for that right now right. out in the world. Yeah. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, the, fundamentally the issues are that um, we are the consuming creatures we are because we have a lot of egoic drives, desires, wants, perceived needs that <clears throat> drive all kinds of irresponsible behaviors, both personal and ecological. And I believe if we could find a way to um, satisfy our egos, or maybe get rid of our egos, or at least get them down to bite size, that uh, we could behave much more responsibly ecologically, just because we aren't so driven by this big ego. So to me, if you want a fundamental change in our, all of our behaviors, ecological and sustainability, as well as everything else, you've got to somehow go after this egoic construct that's driving all of our needs and desires. Because if we don't have those, then you behave in a whole different manner. Right. That, you know, from the perspective of ego, desire feels infinite, personal desire. Mm -hmm feels infinite, precisely because we're squeezing, squeezing primary consciousness, the totality of our evolutionary inheritance of our brain, through this tiny little nozzle. So if we want something, it feels very big, right, in proportion. <laughs> it feels like there's, like, you know, with lights we say we're wired for that, and we just want that. And I think many of us have come to believe that we're wired to want to consume more and more and more. But experientially, that doesn't seem to be the case. Once you wither uh, the egoic investment, it's not that those kinds of consumer desires don't pop up, but they're not the sort of overwhelming, life-orienting phenomena that they seem to be otherwise. Exactly. You don't you don't have to find the best uh, langostino in the world. You have to go around the world trying to find the absolute best lobster. You might be just satisfied with having, you know, something much simpler. Uh, so much of that's driven by our need for you know, moving up and trying to get more and trying to gain status, and ego, and structure. Uh, when in fact, if you can pull that, pull that down, that doesn't happen at all. That's not a, a motivator whatsoever. So it becomes less relative and more absolute. I mean, so much of our behavior is relative behavior. We see people getting upset because they only get made. One fellow in Wall Street, forty-five million dollars last year. It must be difficult. He had. He was. I'm quitting my job, and this is un, this is unacceptable. I've been humiliated long enough. Nobody appreciates him. Nobody appreciates me, and I'm <laughs> and I am taking four of my buddies who made ten million dollars a year, and we're quitting this. We're going to go someplace where they care about us, and that's a relative game. Yeah. You see the relative game amongst the CEO salaries, amongst the sports figure salaries, rock star salaries. It's a relative game. It's not an absolute game. So if we got to get the person out of it that's creating this relativity and get into, okay, what do you really absolutely need to live on? Do you need $45 million a year? Or can you live scrape by on a million dollars a year? And I, I think that's the, the thing we've got to get our hands around. And what's driving that behavior, the relative behavior, is all this comparisons. You know, I'm the here on the pyramid, and he's here in the pyramid, and I'm certainly better than he is, so pay me some more money. And I think that's we've got to unwind that as well, too. 
Well, and it's in the marginal differences that both economics and ecology work anyway. In other words, those relative differences, <clears throat> in order to tune our system, our global infrastructure, towards a less impact on the biosphere, we're looking at precisely stepping down the marginal increases, right. not this kind of total renunciation that I think often sits in the background of a lot of people's understanding of where we have to go with uh, sustainability, that we have to sort of like just say no to a beautiful, fulfilling life when in fact that's not the case, right? Uh, in other words, to entertain the argument, somebody might say, well, you know, if people didn't chase down those absolute best uh, langoustine, you know, all over the world and they didn't like push themselves to produce the most beautiful, effective glazing on those langoustine, we wouldn't have that kind of pursuit of beauty in the world. Um, but of course, the counter argument would be that, well, why don't you find the beauty that's right in front of you already instead of chasing it around the world? I mean, I think that's part of what people think they hear. They hear sustainability and they think less. They hear boring. They, they Maybe they see kind of masses of East Block people queuing uh, <laughs> for extremely rough toilet paper, right? right? When, in fact, it is about beauty, what we're talking about, this inward revolution. It's just about not chasing beauty that is only relative and not absolute. Yeah. yeah cause you, you've experienced yourself. As you begin to unwind this egoic structure, you can find beauty in the most simple things. I mean, there's such elegance in a leaf or a frost on the grass or a flower or something. Not to get all, you know, po po on this or po poetic on this thing, but the whole idea of there's great beauty in everyday life by just getting yourself out of the way, getting your, elder, your relative ideas, oh, you know, I saw this great painting at the Met yesterday, whatever it was. You can't just walk outside the Met and walk into Central Park and see that, in fact, there's fantastic beauty in Central Park. It has nothing to do with something costing $45 million. You can just walk over and see the squirrels. You can see the flowers. You can see the trees. And there's great beauty in that. And we've got to get away from the believing that it has to be some expensive object and find it really in our daily lives. If you get out of the way, you can move into that space. Right, and we have to get away from the idea that simplifying our consumption and simplifying our life somehow means we're living a less aesthetic existence. I mean, to the contrary, right? Everything begins to sparkle <clears throat> once you're no longer looking past it right. to the Met or the right. Lamborghini or right. the Langoustine, right? right. Um, and I think that's where the feedback loops really start to operate, you know, is, is that um, I learned this at first on ecodelics, but then I learned to appreciate it uh, through meditation, where just tarrying for a minute with the nature of what actually is can become overwhelmingly beautiful. Right. And, you know, Sarah, you can take on a crazy aspect, too. There's one of the famous stories out of India that these two renunciates, sannyasis, renounced everything. You know, they had thrown away all the things. And they were down to just loincloths. And they were sitting on the beach arguing with each other because one guy thought the other guy's loincloth was a little bit too finely woven. <laughs> and so it really got down to, you know, it isn't, you've got to change the person. You can't yeah. just change the external surroundings. It's not enough to say, I'm done to my loincloth. I'm like, well, your loincloth is pretty fancy. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to be awfully, be you know, awfully not pretty with yeah. your loincloth. Yeah. I remember this argument we yeah, had, exactly. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, it was too fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so it really, it really does get down to, you've got to get the person out of it. You've got to get the egoic structure out of it because no matter how much you give away, you can still sit there with just a loincloth on the beach, and you'll be comparing. So the, the issue is getting that somehow that egoic structure broken down so it doesn't run after structured relative uh, achievements. Well, I think it was Gandhi, right, Who's, uh, when people asked him, you know, how is it that I can have possessions or you can have possessions? And he said, oh, well, you know, possessions are no problem whatsoever. Renounce the possessor. That's right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, to loop it back to sustainability, is it fair to offer the uh, apparent non sequitur, which is that if you care about sustainability, if you care about the ecosystemic destiny of the planet, if you care about biodiversity, you should meditate. Yeah. And you also, we've, we've touched on this, if you realize it's all one, and not just metaphorically or not philosophically or intellectually, 
But if you really do begin to understand that we're, this is all one thing, not just me and the rest of the things, it's all one thing, then why would you go around doing what you do? I mean, some of the crazy behaviors that people uh, do, non-sustainable, that you just, oh, this is all one thing. You know, why would I mess this up? And you behave differently. But you've got to somehow get to unwind that structure in a way that gives you that clear understanding, not just intellectual, but true understanding. One way to get to that, it's all one thing, which I think a lot of people recognize conceptually and also maybe are allergic to conceptually because they think, oh, you know, monotheism or fascism. Right. Uh, right. <clears throat> but one thing I found useful is just to ask myself, where does it start? If there are separate things, where do they begin and end? And, and the closer I look at any allegedly separate thing, such as myself mm -hmm. from another person, I find that it's not. I mean, so that could be one path of inquiry that people would take up is to just ask themselves where there could possibly be anything else. Mm -hmm. since it's all one thing. Right. 